And good afternoon. Welcome to AP Creek. Hey, we're so glad to see all of you here in the building. Why don't you stand with us? We're also glad to have you joining us online. And uh, man, we're live here in the sanctuary in West Lynn. We have another awesome opportunity to sing praises to the Lord because something that is uh, just as true yesterday as today is that he is worthy of our worship and he wants to spend time with us. So uh, let's praise him and uh, sing out together in Jesus' name, amen? Amen, let's worship.
beautiful grace over me your love has set me free beautiful grace you stole my heart and each day is a brand new start salvation by the work of your son on the cross, but also the grace and the mercy that you offer us daily. New mercies in the morning and grace all day long as we stumble through this life. But Lord, we can turn to you and the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, cleanses our sins and you took that penalty for us. And so we are grateful, Lord, this afternoon and we wanna continue to sing of your mercies. We thank you in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but wholly trust in Jesus' name.
gets you fine Come lay your burdens down He'll take all of the chains you bring All you thirst with no relief All those with wells run dry Come to the richer spring He'll quench your soul and satisfy near to you on this Sunday afternoon, Lord, that we would find ourselves submitting ourselves to you, giving our lives, even as we just sang, Lord, submitting ourselves completely, not holding back part of our lives for ourselves, but I pray that, Lord, we would just surrender all to you because, Lord, we find that as we give our lives to you, Lord, you are everything we need. The things that we thought we needed that were gonna bring us satisfaction and happiness, Lord, those things are often found so um, really falling short of what they promise, but you never fail us. Your ways are so much better than our ways and your thoughts are wiser than our thoughts. And so on these Sundays, we wanna sync back up with you. We want your word to just ring in our hearts and our minds with loud and clear truth. Give us, Lord, an ability to hear what your spirit would say to your church today as we study the Bible. Bless this time we ask, we invite you to this service in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. And why don't you make yourself comfy, have a seat, and welcome. It's good to see everybody. Um, and not only you that are here in the room, but also those that are online. Man, we're glad to have you all with us. A large group of folks when you add it all up. So good to have you. A um, couple quick announcements, things you should be aware of. Um, you know, uh, don't forget, we've, we've been doing, you know, during this whole lockdown and stuff, we started doing food boxes and uh, we've, you know, teamed up with some of the local businesses and these, these great, you know, grocery bags basically are available to people who need uh, a little help. Uh, and it's great, they're amazing. Uh, and uh, we're gonna be opening those back up again for the next few weeks. Those will be on Wednesdays uh, from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. for, a, uh, you know, just to come and pick up the groceries. Uh, you can call the church office or check online to find out more info about that, but that's starting up again, which is cool. Do um, you guys wanna see a quick video snippet? Why don't you close the blinds just for a second, guys? I wanna show you, the reason I wanna show you this is um, a lot of you don't know the wonderful work our children's ministry has been doing with their uh, Kid Zone uh, online uh, stuff, and it's really fun. And I just wanted to show you a couple snippets of what they're doing, so I asked them to put together a quick you know, video. And uh, if you have kids, grandkids, neighbor kids, like pass the word, this is great stuff. <clears throat> and they're, um, they're uh, just sharing the word and the scriptures, and it's just awesome. Why don't you go ahead and roll that? Hello, and welcome to Puppet Weekly Live. I'm Dan Duncan. And I'm Cindy Churchill. The ice cream is like a frozen ball of happiness on top of a corn filled with joy. <laughs> oh, oh no, I messed it up! <laughs> but the building something brings this much joy to my heart. Can you imagine the joy that God felt creating everything? Ooh. Good morning, America, and welcome back to Local Talk, the talk show where we talk locally. That's right. And when I say flip, then you flip as fast as your fingers can flip to John 16, 13. And, and singing to him, we get to worship God. And when we do, we become who he made us to be. Oh, thank you. Look at that. We're going on a Bible quest. Go to Zoom! where Jesus comes in. Jesus took our penalty on the cross. That's awesome! <laughs> Me, only problem is, look, the cookie's going down into the anthill. You're gonna have to dig that out. All right, come on, <laughs> that's for me. Yes, those guys, <laughs> there's some funny stuff in there. Uh, you guys go, you gotta love Fritz and Stein. Have you guys watched Fritz and Stein? That's great stuff. But anyway, make sure and pass the word. It's good stuff and, uh, and it's great for the kids to have something to watch that's actually legit. Um, hey, speaking of legit, Wednesday night, we're continuing our Through the Bible study, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, right through the Bible. We've been doing that for 25 years. And, um, and we're on our second time through, and we happen to be in the book of Jeremiah. So would you grab your Bible and turn with me to Jeremiah chapter five for today's study. One of the things I say often, uh, you know, is this idea of when we go through the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, one of the things we've learned over the years is where we're at in the Bible is where we're at in life. Where we're at in the Bible is where we're at culturally. It's amazing how the Lord just kind of works it out for us as we're going through the Bible. It's pretty cool to see how that always works out. And this week was a unique, wouldn't you say, a unique week, wouldn't you agree? This, uh, the, the 2020 election is not just your average week. Um, the nation is still up in a tizzy. Why, Brett? Boy, Biden has declared that he is the president of the United States. It's all settled. Well, as it turns out, there's a lot of uh, questions about some of the uh, shenaniganries 
that were taking place. And so, um, you know, the Trump campaign people are saying, uh, no, it's not over and there's litigation and the Supreme Court's being brought in. And so if you thought it was all finally over, it's not um, actually. And so people are kind of up in arms. The, the, not just the nation. If you were able to tune in on Friday night, we did that, you know, we do our monthly prophecy update on the first Friday of each, each, each month. And, and uh, if you didn't get a chance to look at that, you might want to jump in sometime this week. Our YouTube channel has that. But we were talking about what the world's posturing looks like, uh, in, in depending on how the election turns out. It's not just the United States that's being affected by this. It's actually the world. And so it's, it's been quite a week. And, you know, I'm not going to try to talk about, you know, the one party platform or the other today. But I do want to talk a bit about democracy. And it's not because I want to talk about it. It's, it's actually going to be our text where we are here in Jeremiah chapter 5. Um, let me ask you rhetorically, is, is a democracy a good form of government? Well, there's a question. That, that's a good question. In fact, let me, let me say something that's really radical. I think, now don't take this out of context. I can see somebody taking a snippet of my teaching and doing havoc there with it. But let's just say this. Communism or even socialism, a wonderful form of government. If it weren't for one thing, you guys got silent all of a sudden. <laughs> Communism, socialism, yep, wonderful. If there was, only, the only problem is one little thing called sin. Communism would be wonderful if people didn't sin. You know, socialism basically is saying that you can't really trust the people to decide what's good for themselves. They're not that smart. So you need government to come in and take control for the well-being of all the people. That's kind of what socialism and, you know, evenly spread stuff. And, and if, if socialism would be wonderful if, if the governmental people that were running socialism weren't sinful people. Because greed and inequity and... Uh, evil things creep in because they're sinful people. That's why socialism doesn't work. And it's also why communism doesn't work. But guess what? For you guys, well, yeah, we're all about capitalism. We're all about democracy here in America. That's the one that works. Well, I'm here to tell you that democracy will also fail because of sin. The same thing. What happens, see, democracy, what happens when majority rules? Well, when the majority is kind of whacked. What happens when the whole nation starts to go the wrong direction? See, by definition, democracy, if you look it up in the dictionary, I've looked it up here, a system of government by the whole population or all the eligible members of a state, typically through elected representatives. Another uh, shorter definition, control of an organization or group by the majority of its members. So that's what democracy is, we, we vote. Now, I gotta say, as a kid growing up in America, I, I like that we were a democracy. By the way, you younger people who haven't had a chance to do this in Oregon, the good old days of going down to the polls and voting, I miss that, where you actually go and you draw the curtain and you were able to vote and you felt like they were doing something of substance. It was really cool. Um, I wish some of you younger people could have experienced that. There was like something that seemed very patriotic about it, no matter what side of the aisle you were on. But now this is not the same getting it in the mail and filling in bubbles and sending it off and having it thrown away or whatever happens to it, I don't know. <laughs> um, but it is, a little, it is a little bit troubling, you know, you're kinda like, man, I, I just miss the good old days. But it's not, I don't get the same joy out of the democracy as I once did as a younger voter. And then with all the tensions and the problems in the world, it's, it's, it's become sort of a, a bummer. But I wonder, the democracy that we've enjoyed has been blessed in America for a lot of years. You know, they call it the grand experiment, the United States of America. And I believe one of the reasons we have been blessed is because we are a democracy. But there's something attached to our democracy that you have to understand that makes America the country it is. Why, you know, people, as, as critical as you wanna be of the United States of America, there's still a reason why people are flooding into this nation. People still love to live here. People, you know, uh, from all over the world want to flood into this nation, and, and it's not because we're, you know, uh, you know, perfect. But, but man, there's and we're, we have our flaws. But at the same time, there's a reason why most people want to come here still. And here's what I believe: I believe we are going as a democracy on the momentum 
of the beginning, the founding fathers of this nation who said, we want to establish a nation that's a democratic society, a republic where we actually vote and we have, you know, the electoral college, which some people are criticizing, you know, and all that stuff today because of the way the votes look and outcomes. But it, it really was quite an ingenious plan our founding fathers had. But one thing that made it work is our founders were very much godly people who were seeking godly worldviews and ideas. Now, I know some of you might be saying, well, Brett, that's not what my college professor told me. They were a bunch of deists and they didn't really believe in the Lord and much, much of them were atheists or agnostics. Total lies. And I would challenge you to do your own research because there is a narrative that wants to say they were a bunch of slave owning, you know, sinful, horrible people, you know, and, um, and the evil of our nation and all this stuff. But there's a reason this nation has been so powerful, so successful, the land of the free, the home of the brave. There's a reason. And it goes back to our founders. You know, if you look up what, you know, David Bartlett has done, he, he's collecting the writings, the journals, the documents, from our founding fathers. And these guys weren't just deists. They were people who believed in Jesus Christ. They wanted this to be a godly nation. I've done whole teachings and shown you and I've quoted from these guys who, they, while they're not perfect and they were sinful guys just like us, their goal was to say, we want a moral country. And we want people who are Christians and godly people uh, voting and making decisions on what direction this nation goes. That's just the truth, and whether you want to deny that or not, that's not even really uh, the point of today. But here's what happened. Man, this, this test of a nation with our voting and, and righteousness and churches, well, let me, let, me, let me just give you one quote from a guy named Alex de Tocqueville. Back in the 1800s, the early 1800s, de Tocqueville came from France to explore what makes America, back in the 1800s, growing, successful, doing well, why are, the, why are people flourishing in this land of the free, home of the brave? And Alex de Tocqueville wrote a book, he actually wrote a book called Democracy in America. And he was brilliant, he was a brilliant thinker, and he said a lot of brilliant things, that's why people still quote him all the time. But one of the things he said was this, and I find this almost, you know, Nostradamus or, you know, Orwellian, because he says something that's, well, even almost prophetic. Check this out. He said in his, you know, uh, uh, democracy in America, he said, I sought for the greatness in the United States in her commodious harder, harbors, her ample rivers, her fertile fields, her boundless forests, but it was not there. I sought for it in her rich mines, her vast world commerce, her public school system, and in her institutions of higher learning, but it was not there. I sought for America's greatness in her democratic Congress and her matchless constitution, but it was not there. Not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits flame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and her power. And here's what he concludes by. America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. Wow, right on the nose. Alex de Tocqueville saying, when America ceases to be good, it will cease to be great. That's the problem he's pointing out with democracy. In fact, he even said this in another one of his writings. He said, um, the health of a democratic society may be measured by the quality of functions performed by the private citizens. He understood that democracy works if it's citizens of its nation are gonna be good people and do the right thing and be morally driven by good, solid morals. And he said it was in the churches that he found that people were, were, were ignited with, with biblical worldviews and, and godly notions. And he said, that's where America's greatness is. And he saw that back in 1835. But what you and I are seeing, and we've witnessed this, if you're my age, man, you've seen a massive shift and what we believe is moral, what we believe is right, what we believe is good. Man, if you've been following it as I have in my lifetime, I remember, you know, when we started saying, let's get prayer out of schools and separation of church and state, which was never really the intent of Thomas Jefferson 
when he wrote the letter to the Danbury Baptist, but I'm not gonna get into all that stuff. But the point is, our nation starts to say, well, we gotta keep God out of government, out of school. So we did that. And in my childhood, that's when they said, no more prayer in schools. And then we saw you know, the church start to cave and start to become more secularized. And some of the things the church started doing where we started accepting sinful things, even though the Bible said it was sin, the church said, oh, that's not sin. It's, it's in a lot of even you young people, your lifetime, you've seen the church of Jesus Christ start to accept things that the Bible says, no, that's an abomination to the Lord, like things like homosexuality. I remember in 2006, when the Episcopal Church um, the Anglican church. I remember, some of you remember this too, and it was kind of a shock at the time, way back in 2006. Um, the newly elected U.S. Episcopal Church uh, Bishop, Catherine Jeffords Shorey, maybe you remember this, when on CNN she was asked, is homosexuality a sin? And she said, homosexuality is no sin. And she declared that in front of the nation for, the, for that denomination of the Episcopal Church, which is basically a... a you know, a, um, the Catholic church, but just Protestants. <laughs> That's what the Episcopal church is. Stand up, sit down, you know, and, and all that stuff, the robes, the pointy hats, all that stuff. That's the Episcopal church. Now, um, she said, I don't believe it. Some people come into this world with affections toward uh, other people of the same gender. And some people come into this world with, with affections directed of people of the other gender. She's saying, it's all a wash and homosexuality is okay. Jeffords, who uh, was raised in Roman Catholic Church and graduated with marine biology with a doctorate specialization in squids and oysters. I thought that was funny too. <laughs> it's okay to laugh. I thought that was funny too. <clears throat> uh, squids and oysters, that was her specialty. And uh, when, do you guys remember uh, when she was supporting uh, the Bishop Jean Robinson in New Hampshire, the first openly gay bishop in more than 450 years of Anglican history. And then later, Jean Robinson got into legal trouble for sexual promiscuity, um, if you recall. And I remember, we were all stunned. Pastors of churches, like, wow, I can't believe the church is actually open to say, saying what the Bible says is an abomination before God. Now, don't get me wrong. This is where the world tries to misquote and misappropriate what I'm saying. Are we mad at gay people? Are we mean to gay people? Do we love gay people? Like, they're all making it hate and all this stuff. That's not what the church does. Um, I, I don't know anybody, I've never met anybody that says I hate gay people. Now, if I did, I would say, well, the Bible doesn't teach that that's what you're supposed to do. Um, there's such a funny narrative that if you say that something's wrong and sinful, that you must hate that person. Well, if that was true, as a pastor, you all better think I hate you really bad, because guess what? I'm telling you guys all about sin every single Sunday. This is what the Bible says is sin. Does that mean that I hate you? Quite the opposite. When a pastor shares, hey, this is sinful, the object of that is love. The, the Lord knows what's good for his people. And, and so it, it's, not, it's not about us voting, is this good or bad? It's God saying, this is what's good and this is what's bad. So when the church started becoming democratic, we started having churches say, well, we no longer wanna call that sin. And as a nation, we're seeing that even worse. Remember back then when, I, when we saw that happening, I said, you watch. And I told the church years ago, back at AC Creek Middle School, we were, I said, someday pedophilia is the next new pioneer area of sexual promiscuity in America. And man, we're seeing that. And there's powerful groups right now that are defending older men having sex with younger boys. Like this is just crazy. This is what we're seeing in our society and why? Because the majority is starting to waver on what they say is right and wrong. And instead of having a standard that is immovable and unshakable, we're letting the democracy decide. So should we be surprised when we as Bible people, we say, well, the Bible talks about the unborn baby as a child and it's a, a, a work that God is doing and abortion, according to the Bible, that's why we, we Christians are one of the few people saying, yeah, abortion is, is wrong and, and it's sinful. We're not saying that just to be mean or trying to say we want control over someone else's body. We're actually saying there is a little body within a body and the Bible calls that little body a life. It's not a blob of fetal tissue, it's a life. So when we have a democratic society saying, well, do we call that a life or do we call it a blob of fetal tissue? And people vote on it. Well, that hasn't worked out so well. We have a Supreme Court that votes on things like that. 
And that's where the democracy that I so loved as a kid growing up has let us down. It's the problem is sin. People that are voting are sinners. That's where democracy will fail us. And, and I'm telling you this because I believe that it's possible our nation is heading, headed for the cliff. I feel like we're about to fall off the cliff, whether it's now or sooner than later. I, I believe it's coming quick. And, and the Bible even talks about the nation that gets away from these kind of you know, morals and we start doing our own thing. Well, we're gonna be a nation in trouble. And that leads us to our text here in Jeremiah. Jeremiah the prophet, is it living in a day that's very much like the day we're living in today? And the people were doing stuff that's very much like what the people are doing today. Where we're at in the Bible is where we're at in life. Let's take a look. It's Jeremiah chapter five, verse 30. Jeremiah five, verse 30. It says this, a wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely and the priests bear rule by their means. And my people love to have it so. And what will you do in the end thereof? The New International Version puts it, uh, you know, this, this, the King James kind of confuses us when it says a wonderful, horrible thing. Well, is it wonderful or horrible? In the Old English, did you know the word wonderful could either mean good or extremely bad? It's like you'd step back and say, wow, I'm full of wonder at how horrible that is. That's what the King James is trying to say in the Old English, 1611 English. But the New International gets it more in a modern way. The way it should really read is, in uh, New International says, a horrible and shocking thing has happened in the land. Now, this is interesting because it goes on in NIV. It says, the prophets prophesy lies. The priests rule by their own authority. And my people love it this way. But what will you do in the end? It's like Jeremiah's, you know, the mafia saying, what are you gonna do? And that's how he ends this chapter. What are you gonna do? And that's really a question before us. What are you gonna do about what Jeremiah is talking about? Because it's not just for Jeremiah's day, it's for our day as well. And what's going on? Well, there's a horribly shocking thing happening. Now, would you mark that? Because God is speaking to the children of Israel saying there's something that's horrible and something that's shocking. Something that's horrible and some, when God says that, should we sit up and go, we should probably take a look at this. If God is, say something, God is saying something's horrible and shocking, then we should sit up. And here it is, that the, the prophets, man, they're lying to you. The priests, they're in it for their own reasons and for their own purposes. The people, they love it that way. So what are you gonna do about it? See, there's four groups here that we need to kind of think about and meditate on here in our text. First of all, the prophets. And it says, the prophets prophesy falsely. Prophesy falsely. Hmm. Now, this is where I, I want you to understand what a prophet's job was in the Old Testament. And, and I know when I bring this up, I, 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 we get a bunch of emails. And I didn't realize there was so much confusion about this in the Bible. But the prophets of the Old Testament are different than a word of prophecy in the New Testament. And remember when Jesus was talking about John the Baptist, he said, John the Baptist is the last of the prophets. What did that mean? Real simple, that the Old Testament prophets moved in a certain role and function and had a job description. In the New Testament, we don't really have the same kind of prophetic ministry like the Old Testament prophets. Um, in the New Testament, and I'm, I'm getting off course here, but I'm, I'm trying to show you the A and the B here. In the New Testament, the word of prophecy is given to any believer who's filled with the Spirit who the, the spirit, the word is manifest or makes known himself through a person with a word of prophecy. That could be through any one of you. You don't walk around, I alone am a prophet of the Lord. You can't do that today. That's not the same. That was the Old Testament. Jeremiah, Isaiah, Daniel. Those dudes were prophets. But in, in the New Testament church, the Lord speaks a word of prophecy to his people. And so have you, here's an example. I bet some of you have done this and you didn't even know it. Have you ever been talking to someone and you feel like the Lord just kind of gave you something to say that wasn't from your brain, but it was wise and helpful? Like, well, I said something intelligent. <laughs> when you do that, you're like, wow, that's, that's what could be a word of prophecy. First Corinthians 14, right at the very first part of that chapter explains that a word of prophecy is a word of exhortation 
edification or comfort given by the Holy Spirit through a believer. And that's a good ministry. Um, and it also talks about tongues, speaking in tongues. But isn't it interesting, tongues gets all the press when we talk about manifestations of the Holy Spirit. People say tongues, oh, what about tongues, 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 tongues. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, tongues is the least of the gifts. But a word of prophecy, it's a word of edification, exhortation and comfort by the Spirit through the person. And man, I love it when the Lord moves in that way through his people. So that's, that's the prophecy that's given in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament time, there were prophets. That was their job description. And they were to, and it was real simple, speak God's word to the people. But I wanna say that was a really dangerous job. That's why if you're walking around, I'm a prophet like in the Old Testament, you better hope not. Like, think about it, you know, um, if you spoke a wrong word of prophecy in the Old Testament, what were they supposed to do to you by law? Take you outside of the city and stone you to death. That's, that's, that's not a good day at the office right there, if you blow it. So first of all, if you're a prophet of the Bible, you better have your game on and be t tied in with the Lord. Secondly, Old Testament prophets were asked to do crazy stuff. Remember when we were in Isaiah? There's Isaiah just being a prophet and the Lord says, okay, Isaiah, I got an assignment. Cool, Lord, sign me up. Here am I, send me. Okay, Isaiah, strip down naked. Uh, okay, now what? Uh, now I want you to walk around Israel naked for a whole year. Just walk around naked. Why, Lord? Because I want you to tell the people, even as I am naked, you are naked before the Lord, Israel, thus saith the Lord. That's another tough day at the office right there, if you ask me. Or Jeremiah, a prophet of the Lord. Nobody listened to a word he said and they threw him in a dungeon, they tie him up, they chained him, they beat him up. Jeremiah, man, tough gig being an Old Testament prophet. But, but here's the thing, here's Jeremiah and, and the point of a prophet is to give the word of the Lord to the people and that's how the Lord rolled in the Old Testament. Now you say, okay, Brett, hold on a second. The prophet gave the word of the Lord to the people. In the New Testament, a prophecy or a word of prophecy is a little different. Well, what's the equivalent in the New Testament? This is your quiz. What's the equivalent of the Old Testament prophet in the New Testament days? If it's not a word of prophecy like 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 12, what is the equivalent? It's easy, the answer, anybody? Huh? The word of God. Remember, an Old Testament prophet was to speak the word of God to the people. They didn't have you know, Genesis through Revelation back in the Old Testament days. They didn't have Bibles like we do. So they would speak the word of God and God said, that's such a serious job. If you get it wrong, you're gonna be stoned to death. That's, that was the Old Testament. But man, you and I, we have the word of God, not through the mouth of a prophet. We have the word of God right here, written in black and white before us. And there's no speculation. There's no worry. Is this true or false? This book that's sitting before us today has been tried and true for millennia and it gives us the word of God. And it's the complete word of God. There's not to be any adding to this book or taking away from this book. And, and it's, it's the standard, it's the compass, it, it's the test to see if somebody, somebody, somebody's saying something, if it's true or false. And so that's kind of the thing we look at today. When it says the prophets prophesy falsely, you and I, we have to say, is, is what that person's talking about today is it true or false? And the way we know is we measure it against the word of God. So when the Pope comes out, I told you about the Episcopal Church, you know, accepting homosexuality in 2006. When the Pope came out just two weeks ago and saying that he, uh, the Catholic Church now embraces civil union between same gender, um, the Catholic Church was blown away. Why? Because for you know, a long, long time, the Catholics believed that homosexuality was a sin. Suddenly the Pope, now they got a problem when the Pope says stuff like that, and here's why. Depending on if you're a Vatican II Catholic or what kind of a Catholic you are, some of the Catholics believe the Pope, when he says something, guess what? His word is equal to this word. Did you know that? That's what Catholics believe, some of them. They believe that he's infallible. So when he says something that relates to doctrine, the Pope, he gets it right every time. He's like inspired just as much as the Bible's inspired. So that's why the, the Catholic Church is up in a tizzy right now because the Pope just changed doctrine that's big time doctrine that they've gone for hundreds and hundreds of years unchanged until he just kind of said it. What do you do with that? 
And it's not just the Catholics, it's the Protestants as well. The, the, the Christian church has largely changed doctrine and what's true and what's false, what's good and what's bad. And it's, the problem is that they're letting people lie to them about what is good and bad. You and I have a job to do. Uh, maybe even you have a better job to do than I do. I'm, the, I'm a pastor, I'm teaching the Bible. The Bible says in the New Testament, you're gonna have pastors and teachers. But what are you supposed to do Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Paul the apostle commended the church there to the Thessalonians, or, or more than the Thessalonians, said you need to be like the Bereans, not as those people in Thessalonica, but be like the Bereans. And what were they doing? They were people that would hear somebody talk, like Paul, and they'd go home and search the scriptures to see if what that guy was saying was true or false. It was the word of God that the the, the Bereans would search and they knew that was the standard. I'm concerned that you and I are living in a day kind of like Jeremiah's day where the people were all excited because the prophets, they would lie to them. Can I show you an illustration of what I'm talking about? Um, I love how the Bible's full of pictures and illustrations. Flip over to 2 Chronicles chapter 18. Keep your finger here in Jeremiah and go to 2 Chronicles chapter 18. And there we have this great story. It's actually kind of a funny story if you ask me. Um, you got this guy, these two kings that come together, the king of Israel and the king of Judah, the north and the south. The one king is a good king. His name, Jehoshaphat. Funny name, nice guy, not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I'll show you what I mean in a minute. The other king, Ahab, evil king, king of Israel, and he's just a bad dude, married to Jezebel. Like it doesn't get much worse than Ahab. He's an he's a evil dude. But Jehoshaphat and Ahab come together. Why? Because the Syrians are getting ready to trounce on them militarily. The Syrians are coming. They're freaking out. So they join forces, they get together, and they have a little powwow, the king uh, from the north and the king of the south. And they sit in their thrones with their royal robes, and they say, should we go up and fight against the Syrians? And that's where we pick it up. Second Chronicles 18, verse 4. And there it says, and Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Ahab, inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. Therefore the king of Israel gathered together of prophets 400 men and said unto them, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle or shall I forbear? And the 400 prophets, they said, go up, for God will deliver it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat said, is there not here a prophet of the Lord beside that we might inquire of him? Now, now what's going on here? Ahab, who's godless, wicked, evil king, he says, oh, you wanna hear from the Lord? Okay, I'll get my prophets. Hey, prophets, Ahab's prophets, come on in here. And 400 dudes, come on in. Uh, we're asking you a, a question as prophets. Should we go fight the men, men of Ramoth Gilead? And they're like, knock yourself out. God is with you. Go and do all that's in your heart. <clears throat> but Jehoshaphat, being a godly guy, he says, I don't know that I feel like this is the word from the Lord, from these 400 prophets. Do you have another prophet to, that we can ask? Anybody else? And listen, to, this is Ahab's response. He says in uh, verse, verse seven, the king of Israel, Ahab, said to Jehoshaphat, there is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him, for he never prophesies good to me, but always evil. His name is Micaiah, the son of Imlah. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. In other words, don't just disregard this guy because you don't like him. Verse eight, so the king of Israel called to fetch his officers and said, fetch quick, quickly Micaiah, the son of Imlah. While they're fetching Micaiah, this, this contrary you know, prophet that Ahab hates because he always tells them stuff that he doesn't like, while they're getting him, the 450 prophets, or the 400 prophets, I should say, start going, hey, we need to make sure and convince the kings that our word is right, and this guy that's coming, that they don't listen to him. So they, they gather back in front of the two thrones, and that's where we pick it up in verse nine. And it says, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat either of them on his throne, clothed in their robes, and they sat in the void place at the entering of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets prophesied before them. And Zedekiah, not the king, but a different Zedekiah, Zedekiah, the son of uh, Chenaanah, had made him horns of iron. And he said, thus, uh, and he said, thus saith the Lord, with these 
as he's kind of demonstrating the horns that he had made out of iron. With these, you shall push Syria until they be consumed. And all the prophets prophesied uh, so, saying, go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. Man, these guys are going full bore. Should we go and do this? They said, do it. And then they, they said, well, go get Micaiah. Oh, oh, let's really. So this guy gets all dramatic and gets his horns and acts like a bull. <laughs> and like a bull, that's how you're gonna destroy Syria. And it got real dramatic and weird. Meanwhile, verse 12, the messenger that went to call Micaiah spake to him saying, behold, the words of the prophets declare good to the king with one assent. In other words, they're all in agreement. Let your word therefore, I pray thee, be like one of theirs and speak thou good. I got a letter the other day that kind of cracked me up. It's like this, this guy saying, okay, they want you to go and say something, but only say something that's good. Don't say whatever you think you're gonna say. I got a letter, people saying, Brett, you owe the people apology from the pulpit. I'm, I'm thinking, why, why did I do? Because of what you're saying about you know, uh, churches and, and people that are not teaching truthfully and stuff like that. And, and the, it's, it's, I kind of feel like this prophet where you, know, you speak the truth from the Bible and there's some people are going, we don't want to hear it. You need to not say that stuff. Here's what you should say. And that's what this guy tells Micaiah. You need to say what's good, but check out what Micaiah says. And I say this to the people that wrote the letter Verse 13, Micaiah said, as the Lord liveth, even what my God saith, that will I speak. So, and when he came, uh, when he was come to the king, the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle or shall I forbear? And he said, go up and prosper and they shall be delivered into your hand. You say, Brett, that, 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 he said the exact thing word for word that the other 400 prophets said. But Brett, you also put in sarcasm. How do you know that sarcasm? Well, it's there and you can see why. The king then answers and said, uh, verse 15, the king said unto him, how many times shall I adjure thee that thou say nothing but the truth to me in the name of the Lord? In other words, the king Ahab, the evil king says, I know that you're being facetious. I know that you're being sarcastic. Tell me what the real deal is. And then, you could almost hear a pin drop now in the throne. All the 400 prophets are like, what's he gonna say? And now Micaiah, it's like he gets serious. He was being sarcastic before. Yeah, go do whatever they said. Yeah, that's it. And the king says, no, tell us what the, what the Lord is really saying. And that's when he says with great seriousness, verse 16. Then he said, I did see Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let them return, therefore, every man to his house in peace. In other words, don't go to war. If you go to war, Israel's gonna have their shepherd gone. The king will be killed. That's the idea. Ahab will die if you go to war with Syria. So tell everybody just to go home and be peaceful. And the king, Ahab, listen to what he says in verse 17. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good unto me, but evil? It's like he said, see, I told you, this guy's a jerk. He said, I'm gonna die. Um, now, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Micaiah is telling the king the truth, but this guy doesn't wanna hear it. What happens in this story? Well, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but, but here's what happens. Uh, Ahab says, well, I'm gonna outsmart God, and, uh, and here's what I wanna do. And he goes to Jehoshaphat and says, let's go to battle. Let's go fight these Syrians. Only, here's what I want you to do, jo Jehoshaphat, Ahab says, I want you to wear my crown and my robes and ride my horse and you'll look just like me. And then you will go into battle. And Jehoshaphat's like, yeah? And, and then he says, I'll dress up like a normal soldier. I'll just blend in. Okay. See, that's when I told you Jehoshaphat's not the snar sharpest knife in the drawer. Like, why don't you just put a bullseye on your chest? 10, 20, 30, 40. Like, seriously, like, why, <laughs> like why, why would you dress up like the king that everybody wants to kill? And Jehoshaphat says, okay, I'll do that. And he rides into the battle dressed as Ahab. Well, that's where we pick it up. I'll just, a few more verses, then we're done with the story. But, but it says right here, in verse 31, that it came to pass when the captains of the chariot saw Jehoshaphat that they said, this is the king of Israel. Therefore they compassed around him. They surrounded him to fight him. But Jehoshaphat cried out and the Lord helped him and God moved them to depart from him. Don't you love that? The Lord helps the dull knife in the drawer. Uh, I'm thankful for that personally, I really am. 
Verse 32, for it came to pass that when the captains of the chariots perceived that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back again from pursuing him. Now here's where the story ends for Ahab, the wicked king, verse 33. And a certain man drew a bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. Therefore he said to his chariot man, turn thine hand that thou mayest carry me out of the host or out of the, the battle for I am wounded. Now this is great. The King James language puts it this way, but when it says that a, a certain guy with a bow and an arrow at a venture, it means he arbitrarily pulls his bow and his arrow and like he doesn't even aim it. He just kind of shoots an arbitrary arrow. And what happens? Ahab, who thinks he's outsmarting God, says, I'm not even dressed as the king. They don't even know who to shoot. And there he is in the group of guys and some guy just shoots a random arrow in a random direction and God directs that arrow right through the air and it says between the harness. The idea is right where his armor meets his shoulder armor and his breastplate, the arrow just went right in between those two armors and chink, struck him. And he told his chariot guy, get me out of here. And he bled out in that chariot that day. And when they got home to where he lived, his palace, the dogs came and licked up his blood, if you remember the story. I won't even tell you what happened to his wife. It gets really rated R, I can't even tell you guys, it's brutal. But you say, Brett, that, that story is kind of ugly. Well, notice there's so much here. They had 400 prophets telling them what to do, but they were lying to him. They were telling him what he wanted to hear. You see, there's some things you should watch out for when it comes to this idea, and I think this is where you and I have to be careful today. Um, beware of number one, drama. You know, the guy with the ox horn saying, you're gonna go like this ox and you're gonna plow through those Syrians and you're gonna win. Just because it's dramatic doesn't make it true. I fear that Christians today, we, we get into emotion and more into the experiences. It's all about emotion and experience. And if that pastor is running back and forth on the stage and sweating in his Armani suit and he's got his Armani rag to wipe his Armani sweat, uh, that makes it legit somehow because it's, it's dramatic. Beware of drama. Just because something's drama doesn't make it true or emotional. Um, I, I fear that a lot of our young people are getting sucked into sort of, you know, false doctrine or teaching that's at least dangerous or at least a little bit off the rails even, some of it, just because there's emotion and commotion. Watch out, beware of drama. Also beware of number two, the majority. It was 400 prophets to one in our story here. And as it turns out, the one prophet was right and the 400 other prophets were wrong. And in a, a nation that majority rules, I feel like we're headed for real trouble there. Our democracy is gonna fail us in that as we get further and further away from doing the right thing as a majority. I think this nation, if we keep going the direction we're going, it'll be in a short order that the majority will far outlast. Right now, our nation is divided, it seems, right down the middle. But I think the further away we get from God and the further away we get from the Bible, we're gonna see the majority rule and it's gonna be our downfall. Democracy will be our downfall, I believe that. But also be careful of the majority even in the Christian church. Just because, you know, there's a huge group of people saying it. You know, the, the Episcopal church had 2.3 million people in it when back in 2006 when that pastor said being gay is not sinful. 2.3 million people said, okay, whatever. So it seemed like a large group saying, it must be right. The majority is telling us this. Watch out for the majority. Jesus taught about this, didn't he, when he said, the way that leads to destruction, well, that's the broad path. Many people are gonna go down that road. But he said, the road that leads to salvation is a narrow, narrow path. As a Christian, as a believer, I hope you understand, majority should not be ruling in your life. Drama, watch out. The majority, watch out. Flattery, go up king, oh great king, you're gonna have victory. It's a little bit like this positive affirmation nonsense that we tend to do to ourselves. You're good enough, you're smart enough, and people like you. Oh, so I'm a winner. Now nah, you're still a loser. <laughs> no, it's funny. I remember as a kid, uh, you know, I was on a high school basketball team, and I've mentioned it before, but we were the losingest team in America. We made the front page of USA Today. Um, it was horrifying how bad we were. And 
um, I just remember it, was, it just felt so uh, like a waste of time. We'd, we'd, we'd be in the locker room before the game and the coach, come on out, you, you guys can do it. You're gonna win this time. And we're all like, no, we're not. And I was like, <laughs> well, Brett, that was your problem. You didn't have a positive mental attitude. No, our problem was we didn't have a basketball player on our team. Um, so, so it's funny, you know, we can flatter ourselves or talk ourselves into believing things. Watch out for drama, watch out for the majority, watch out for flattery. All three of these elements were in where these prophets were lying to the king. This is what Jeremiah says, this is a horrible thing that the prophets are lying to you and they're not telling you the word of God. Man, I hope that pastors are telling people the word of God because I'm, I'm finding it so easy today to kind of have us, us pastors, we, we like to give you our opinions and talk about fluffy things like, you know, how to balance your checkbook and how to have a healthy marriage and how to do this and what to do in that and how we're supposed to be victorious and be full of this and that and the other thing. I, I think we should be careful that we're not being, you know, drama, the majority, flattery, right into just things are not true. The word of God is true. And that's why we go through the Bible. So you have the prophets, number two, you have the priests, the priests. And what was wrong with them? Well, the priests rule by their own means, or as our New International Version put it, the, the priests rule by their own authority. Um, the priests were official ministers who would, you know, the prophets spoke the word of God to the people. The priest would offer the people to the Lord and that he would sort of, his job was to reconcile the people to God through sacrifice, through the worship service in the tabernacle or the temple. So they would sacrifice a lamb for the sins of the people and the day of atonement and all those important things, right? So the priest was supposed to represent the people to the Lord. Um, but here the priest didn't care about the people. They cared about their own agenda. The priests wanted to do it their own way and they wanted to worship in their own way. They came up with their own harebrained way of doing stuff. Even though the Bible told the priests, here's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to have a priest. He's supposed to be a Levite. He's gonna wear an ephod and have the Urim and the Thummim and all this, the what? Well, we gotta go back to our study in Leviticus and some of the other passages about what the priests were supposed to do. But it was very clear. There was no arbitrary wondering about what, what's, what the priest's supposed to do. I showed you an example in 2 Chronicles 18 of the wacko prophets that were lying. Can I show you a wacko priest? It's in Judges chapter 17. We'll, we'll make this quick, Judges 17. In Judges 17, there was a guy named Micah who was, who was totally wacko. The story is here for us to kind of get this illustration of the priests that do their own thing. Micah was a young guy who had a mom who was loaded with money. He robbed his mother, she must have had like 1,100 pieces of silver in her cookie jar or something because he stole it. As he stole the money from his mother, the mother's like, oh, somebody stole my 1,100 pieces of silver. And the son finds out, okay, mom, I stole it. And she says, oh, beloved of my son, blessed are you. And she, she doesn't give him a spanking. She says, here, take some money and go buy yourself some gods. Thanks for being honest. So the guy, I know this sounds like a weird story, and it is. The guy goes and buys some gods and makes himself a little temple of gods. Is this a good Jewish thing to do? Well, it's not. And that's where we pick it up in Judges 17, verse five. And the man Micah had a house of gods and made an ephod and teraphim and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. You see, this guy is doing stuff that sort of looks like the Judaistic pra practices of the temple. And he's even wearing an ephod for crying out loud. What's an ephod? Specific garments set aside for the priest to use to lead the congregation in worship. And so he's sort of doing things that sort of look like real religion, but they're actually false. He's got false gods, he's got his little ephod, and he needs a priest. Where can I find a priest? He finds somebody with a bolts. Hey son, get over here, put on this ephod. You're now my priest. Do you see how stupid this whole thing is? But then it gets even weirder where it says here in verse six, in those days there was no king in Israel but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. They're making it up as they, as they go. And I gotta tell you, there's a lot of religious practices where the priests technically should be saying, here's what we're supposed to do and here's what we're not supposed to do. Where did some of our church traditions really come from? Uh, you know, there's a lot of traditions that are traditions of man and some of them are okay if you wanna do certain things, 
But if you don't wanna do certain things, do you have to do, like for example, should I have to wear a pointy hat and a robe? Brad, where's your pointy hat? You're not a real pastor, I'm a Catholic. I was raised in the Catholic church. You guys don't even have a pointy hat. You don't even have a cross for crying out loud in your church. Is there anywhere in the Bible that says you have to have a cross in the church building? I like crosses, I'm not against crosses. Someday we might put a cross up, we really could. But is that required? One of the reasons I don't have a cross is because a lot of you are saying, you have to have a cross. I'm like, no, we don't. <laughs> Read your Bible. Um, it's so funny how people wanna, you know, now again, I'm not against that, but, but there are some things that I kinda am against. For example, some churches say you gotta pray to saints. The Bible says you're not supposed to pray to anybody but the Lord. The, the, you know, Paul told young Timothy, there's one mediator between God and men, and it's not Mary, the mother of Jesus, and it's not the saints, and it's not the Pope, and it's not the Father. In fact, Jesus said, don't call anybody your father. Not speaking of in religious context. Isn't it funny there's churches that have fathers running around? Hello, Father, even though Jesus said, don't call him Father. Read your Bible, it says that. And then it says there's only one mediator between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so somebody went and told somebody, hey, you gotta pray to the saints, and you gotta you know, pray to Mary, and you, you got pointy hats and robes, and you gotta have crosses. I went to the Vatican a few years ago, I was walking around, and, and man, I, I'm just amazed at stuff that the Bible says you're not supposed to do. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Is that pretty clear? Like, did the Lord stutter when he told us that? It's pretty clear to me. You go to the Vatican and there's graven images everywhere. And none of the cross, actually, but a lot of Peter in the Vatican. It's all about Peter. Um, in St. Peter's Basilica there in Rome, I've told you this before, but it, it just shows me, man, this is like idolatry, if you ask me, because there's this big statue of Peter and people line up to kiss the toe of Peter. And they've kissed his toe clean off. <laughs> Seriously, after millions of people going through there, kissing, the granite's just like polished and it's, his toe was gone. Several years back, they got out the JB Weld and like stuck a new toe on there. I'm not kidding, this is true. They, they gave Peter a new toe and then they almost kissed that one clean off. Like last time I was there, that second toe was almost gone. They just need to keep putting those toes on there, toe after toe. Um, why? Because they're kissing this statue. Question, those of you that are real Bible readers, what do you think Peter would say about that? Do you think people are like, yeah, bow down and kiss my toe? Or would he do what he did in the Bible when people bowed down to worship him as like a God and rip his clothes off and say, do not worship me? You see, you just gotta read your Bible and it's pretty clear we've got off the rails because somebody had an idea, hey, let's make a statue of Peter. That's what you gotta do. Watch out when the priests start doing stuff by their own means, by their own authority, instead of using the authority of the word of God. You got the priests who are, well, this priest, by the way, here in Judges chapter 17, this little guy, he even tunes up his little priest because his son was the priest and then some traveler came by and the traveler says, I am from Bethlehem, Judah and I am a Levite. He's like, what, you're a Levite? Son, take off the ephod, give it to this guy. I'll hire you to be my priest because you're a Levite and that fulfills a box, check the box, he's a Levite. You see, the point that I'm making of judges, this guy Micah, who's a Jew, who knows better, he's just making up religion as he goes. Oh, we'll put a Levite, put an ephod on him. Instead of going to Jerusalem in the temple, I'll use my house and I got all these other gods we'll worship. It's all good. We'll check the religion box and call it good. I see the same tendency today where people sort of make religion up as they go. And what we need to hear from the pastors of the pulpits in America is truth. Not just what we think is good or what we think is fancy or uh, emotional or whatever, what we need is doctrinally sound direction to the church of Jesus Christ. So the priests, they were doing it their own way. The prophets, they were lying. Number three, what about the people? Well, the people, it says, and my people love to have it so. Why do people love to have lying prophets and priests that are going the wrong direction? Why would people love that? I think it's because of this. We, the people, like to do things our own way as well. And if the prophets and the priests are making stuff up as they go and lying, what stops us from doing stuff the way we wanna do it? 
You see, I've noticed that there's, there's a new sort of attitude in America, in the American church, where we don't really care much for authority anyway. And we don't trust people, our priests, our prophets, our, our pastors, our teachers, our churches, and we kind of just make stuff up as we go. And because they're doing it, we do it, and suddenly we're all off the rails, and people love it. They don't wanna be under the, the rules of the Bible. They don't wanna have to follow what the Bible actually says. So it sort of gives us license. If the pastors and the preachers and the prophets and the priests and all these people are just doing their own thing, then we can kind of do our own thing too, and the people love it. They love it. Jeremiah is issuing out a dire warning. There's a terribly horrible thing that has happened in the land. This is what God says. And the prophets are lying, the priests are doing their own thing, and the people love it. What about us? Would God say to us the same thing that he's saying through Jeremiah? I believe so. We're seeing in a New Testament kind of way the same lying and the same selfish motivations and the same weirdness in the church that was happening in the Old Testament days. And we have to be careful to, to not be the people who say, we love it that way. We love it. So finally, lastly, number four, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? Well, check it out. Second Timothy 4, verses two through four. Paul told Timothy this, and this should be a reminder for all of us, myself included, preach the word, he says, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. In other words, be patient and don't give up on this. And doctrine, which is the teaching of the word. For the time will come, the idea is in the last days, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. This is what the Lord predicts in the last days through Paul the apostle to young Timothy he says, watch out because in the last days, what is this itching ears thing and people you know, having, itch? it's kind of like, remember your favorite dog? There he is laying in the sun and you walk up and you scratch his belly right under that upper arm and you scratch it, what happens? His leg? Isn't that a funny thing? I love that with my dog, Charlie. It's like his leg just starts going, scratch, scratch. That's the idea here. The church is like, oh man, we kind of have a scratch. And I sort of like to think of God as a woman. A woman? Yeah. And so the, the, the Presbyterian Church, USA, says God is actually not a man. The church just loves that, scratching their little itchy ears. What do you mean, Brett? What are you talking about? Um, the Presbyterian Church um, this was a few years back, but this is a good example of people making stuff up as they go. Um, they, they had a big meeting uh, where they uh, said they need to improve a gender-inclusive language when it relates to the Trinity. Gender-inclusive with the Trinity? Well, yep. Now they decided merely to receive a policy on paper rather than to approve it officially. So the church official said, you can call the Trinity Father, Son, Holy Spirit if you want to but we'd like to replace it. We'd like to slowly transition out of Father, Son, Holy Spirit because, this is what they said, and I quote, um, the uh, language limited to Father and Son has been used to support the idea that God is male and that men are superior to women. Um, so the panel said, among the other proposed options, you can draw from biblical material these names. Instead of saying Father, Son, Holy Spirit, here's some of their favorites. They said, here's what you can say. This is Presbyterian USA Church. You can call the, the, the Godhead mother, child, womb. Can I just say, that's stupid. <laughs> God is not a mother. Um, and, and we don't call Jesus or the Holy Spirit the womb. That's just some stupid person that said that. Um, here's another one, lover, beloved, love. Instead of saying Father, Son, Holy Spirit, say lover, beloved, love. Uh, the third one, creator, savior, sanctifier, which is interesting because those are true, but that's not what he's called. Um, rock, redeemer, friend, king of glory, prince of peace, spirit of love. Like they came up with all these op options. Um, you say, Brett, what's your problem with that? Well, the problem is God is not mother, child, womb. That's just dumb. And I don't want to stand before God someday and God say, Pastor Brett, um, why did you call me a mother when I'm a father? You called me a girl. Like, will God have a problem with that? I think so. Read your Bible. Um, now, don't get me wrong. Uh, if you've been through our teaching through the word, you realize God has all the beautiful attributes of the best of the men and the best of the women. We were created in God's image. But God, as it turns out, does not claim to be a woman. Even though some people want to change that because it makes them feel better. 
Um, it always cracks me up when we try to change God into our image. We were created in his image. You know, if you're a white American, Jesus looks like a surfer from Southern California. If you live in Africa, and I've been to Africa a bunch of times, our African brothers, there's pictures of Jesus that are, you know, just, um, you know, black African skin carrying the lamb on his shoulders. They make Jesus an African guy. But as it turns out, Jesus was a Jew and he would look like a Jew. Um, it's funny how we try to make Jesus look like or God look like the way we want him. That's some of the nonsense of trying to change God and make stuff up as we go. We shouldn't be doing that. So that's the final point is what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do about what Jeremiah is saying? He says, and what will you do in the end thereof? You know, when I hear that question, I see a very ominous truth and it's this. In Proverbs 14, 12, it says, there is a way which seems right to a man, but in the end, it is the way of death. I worry that we can think, well, I like to think of it this way, or I like to think of it that way. And the Lord says, well, I don't care what you like to think. Here's what's true. We've become so relativistic in our religious practices that we throw the Bible out and say, well, I like to think of God. You can like, to, it's, it's kind of like if, if I say, well, I like to think I'm in shape and thin. You'd say, well, Brett, uh, we need to talk. Like, like that, you can like to think stuff until you're blue in the face. It doesn't change it. And so what we need to do is answer this question that Jeremiah is raising rhetorically. What are you gonna do? The answer, hopefully, is this. Submit to the word of God. Don't make stuff up as you go. It's not a democracy. Um, you and I are not, don't have a vote in the matter. You and I say we submit to the word of God. The word of God is proven to be true. And that's what the Lord requires of us is to listen to the word, not to the world. And I believe that as we've become Americans that are so accustomed to a democracy, somehow we think that's the way the church should operate. And I think it's a huge error. Jeremiah says a terribly horrible thing has happened. When men start making stuff up, the prophets are lying, the priests are doing stuff, they're making up religion their own way, and, and, and the people love it. God forbid that that's happening to the church of Jesus Christ. The reason this is so important is because if we get off the truth and onto our own harebrained ideas, people are still gonna be lost. People are still gonna need to be saved from their sins. The gospel is clear, you and I are sinners, we've fallen short, we deserve death and hell eternal. I don't like to, I like to think that hell doesn't exist. That's dumb, hell exists. The Bible talks more about hell than heaven. So you have to say, well, how do I stay out of hell? The Bible makes it clear, you're saved by God's grace through faith, by believing that Jesus came, died on the cross for your sins, and rose up from the grave. And if you wanna be saved, you just confess that with your mouth and believe it in your heart that Jesus did that for you. Repent of your sins and accept Christ. Would you bow your heads please with me? And I'm gonna just, we're gonna finish with one final song and then we'll pack it up and go home. But the band's gonna come up and lead us in one song. But before that, I just wanna ask, if you wanna accept Christ, here's what you do. Repent of your sins. That means to acknowledge before God your sin and say, I'm a sinner. And then you accept the work of the cross, that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. By accepting that, believing that, and saying, I believe that he died, was buried, rose from the grave. You're, you're accepting the work of God. And the Bible says you will be saved. Too easy, Brett. I think you have to do something more than that. It's too easy. Don't forget what Jesus did on the cross was incredible. The greatest work that was ever done on the planet was when Jesus said, it is finished on the cross. That's why we are saved. Not because we deserved it or earned it or we've been really good, none of that. We're saved by his grace through faith in Christ. That's, just, that's what the Bible teaches. So man, you can do that right between you and God right now, accepting Christ. The rest of you, would you search your heart and say, Lord, have I been sucked in to a democracy of religion where I believe things that I shouldn't? Maybe you have been convinced. Well, I think people should just be able to love each other the way they wanna love each other. That's the narrative of the world. Bible says, nope. And by the way, there has to be a line somewhere, isn't there, where people should be able to love each other? What about the pedophile thing? Well, I think a 45-year-old man should just be able to love a 10-year-old boy. Really? People shouldn't just be able to love each other. There's rules, and the rules are in the Bible, and it tells us what's moral and what's not. I wonder if some of you have been a little bit duped 
to start thinking a little bit more like the world and you've moved away from just saying, I believe the Bible, I'm gonna take God's word for what it is. Rather than reading the Bible to judge the Bible, let the Bible judge you. The Bible's way more authoritative than you are. Let it, let it shape your doctrine and how you think. And that's what you should do. As we stand, let's stand right now. Let's search our hearts and let's finish with this final song and let the Lord speak to you in Jesus' name, amen. You give life, you are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope, you restore every heart that is broken great are you lord it's your
praise and worship of you wouldn't stop when we leave this building, but that all week long, we would be singing praises to you, but also living as a living sacrifice. Lord, a sacrifice of praise and worship as we follow you and walk in your way. So Lord, go before us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, a reminder that we have a Sunday night worship, 6 p.m. online. Join us then. Otherwise, we'll see you next time. You are dismissed.